All right, I'm talking to Dr. Gil Troy. He is the Distinguished Scholar of North American History at McGill University uh, and a, an award-winning American presidential historian. He's the author of numerous books about Ronald Reagan, the Clintons, um, and American culture and American politics. And most recently, he's the author, he's, excuse me, he's the editor of a new three-volume set titled Theodore Herzl, Zionist Writings. Um, Dr. Gil Troy, thank you so much. I'm, I'm really grateful. Um, maybe, maybe to start, you could just talk about, uh, your, what, what life is like in Israel these days. I, 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 from what I understand you're in Israel. How is that? I'm in Jerusalem. Uh, and today's a very, very difficult day. Cause we just heard about that, uh, building collapse that killed, uh, at least 21 soldiers. And since October 7th, we've been in this weird roller coaster where, uh, there's so much suffering. There's so much pain, the evil that was unleashed on October 7th continues to reverberate and we continue to hear more and more stories of the killing, the kidnapping, the raping, the pillaging. And Israel really feels it's been put in an uncomfortable and very difficult position. And since then, our kids are on the front lines, uh, fighting, defending themselves, making very difficult decisions, uh, killing people whom they don't want to kill. But, uh, you know, the morality to me of the war really stems from the evil immorality of, of Hamas and everything that's happened to them, as far as I'm concerned, since is on them. Uh, but the strange thing is that even amidst all the suffering, even amidst all the terror, even amidst all the fear, even amidst all the horror, every day you see acts of generosity, acts of graciousness, acts of spiritual power. And so we're all in this kind of daily roller coaster. And more than anybody else, it's very easy to sit in New York and throw thunderbolts of judgment. But let me tell you, every Israeli I know is desperately hoping for a return to peace. And Israelis are hoping for a return to October 6th, even though, of course, I know as a historian that many, many people go to war trying to defend the status quo. And the one casualty that's always, always, always uh, a result of any kind of war is the status quo. And so the challenge really is going to be what does the day after look like and what does tomorrow look like? Yeah, I'd love to talk more about that. But maybe before we get to there, we could just maybe take a step back and talk about what is uh, your relationship with Zionism? Uh, and of course, that's something that you are uh, you've written about and you've spoken about and you've taught about. Um, where does that passion come from, and and how do you how do you teach the history of Zionism? How do you conceptualize it? So there are two these, there are two sides to that question: the personal and the and, and the more professional. So professionally, as you were kind of to say in your introduction, my main job, my real job, is being an American historian. And uh, for a, the the first part of my career uh, in the nineteen nineties, building my career, building my family, I was very much focused on writing about American history, and I was the kind of professor who didn't think it was my job to hijack the podium and turn it into a political platform. And the nicest compliments I would get after teaching the history of uh, US 1865 to the present, I was teaching at McGill right. University in Montreal, uh, people would say, are you a liberal or a conservative? Are you left wing or you right wing? Because my job I thought was just to raise questions and to challenge people. And during what people call the second intifada, I call it Arafat's war against the Oslo peace process. Uh, all of a sudden there's mayhem in Israel, all of a sudden, after Israel went into an Oslo peace process and of course made mistakes because no country is perfect, but really tried to come up with some kind of peace process with the Palestinians, uh, suicide bombings are occurring in buses, in cafes, um, after bar mitzvah ceremonies on Saturday nights. And the academic world is blaming Israel. And my academic colleagues who can make anything complicated they could go to Starbucks and write 32 papers about the uh, anthropology and the economics and the history. When it comes to Israel, say, oh, Israel apartheid, today, you know, colonial, uh, settler colonial, uh, racist, imperialist, and go, really? It's that simple? And I really felt as an academic, and I felt, frankly, of course, as a Jew, um, then, not I'm not talking about the last uh, couple of months, then I felt that something terribly, something had gone terribly wrong in academia, and people had forgotten their core mission, which was to listen to learn from those with whom we disagree, to try to understand complexity. And uh, I also saw in the Jewish community that everybody was very depressed, very defensive, very reactive. Again, I'm talking about 21 years ago, not today. And so I wrote an 800 word essay that changed my life saying, I am a Zionist. And I didn't say anything negative about Palestinians because my Zionist vision is not anti-anti-Zionism. It's not anti-anti-Semitism. It's not a reaction to. But instead it was talking about how lucky we are to be living in Canada at the time and have this exciting adventure, this sense of peoplehood, this sense of this young state that all of us from all over the Jewish world and the non-Jewish world can contribute to. 
And I call this a form of liberal democratic nationalism. I know nationalism is a complicated word these days and a very unpopular word because Donald Trump has tried to own it. And I say, no, that's only one form of nationalism. Nationalism is a neutral term. What we do with nationalism, do we use it to lift ourselves up and lift up our neighbors and lift up the world? Or do we use it to knock others down? That's up to us, but that's not inherent in nationalism. And so I've been trying for the last 21 years to sing a song of Zion, sing a song of what I call identity Zionism, sing a song of Zionism, which isn't about negating others, isn't about disrespecting others, but it's about building up, I call this Pilates, building up the core of Jewish identity, Jewish pride, Israeli identity, Israeli pride, and Zionist pride. Yeah, that's very much the, I think the message of Zionism that I grew up with as well. And I was certainly uh, enamored with for most of my life. Um, I wonder if from your perspective, if, you know, naturally, anytime there's a there's a movement like this, a nationalist movement, uh, you're dealing with a coalition of many different people and many different perspectives and many different uh, motivations and, and, and religious ideologies. Um, is there is there a danger to a kind of strong nationalistic pride? Um, you talked about the Donald Trump version of it in America. Of course, other countries around the world have their nationalisms. Um, is there is there is there is there a part of Zionism which uh, you feel is worth uh, distancing ourselves from? Is there other elements of it that are that are maybe dangerous? Absolutely. Look, you know, I um, I write a weekly column in the Jerusalem Post, so I say I don't need to shrink because I have nine hundred words to sort of walk work out whatever issues I have. And prior to October sixth, uh, I coined the term gunatics to in a shorthand way, consistently denounce Itamar Ben-Gvir, Salo Smotrich, people who I felt were hijacking, not just Zionism, I'll see you and raise you, but hijacking religious Zionism. They called it the Religious Zionist Party, right? But just as we know, every Democrat in the Democratic Party isn't necessarily a Democrat, right? They might be capitally members of the Democratic Party, but they may these days not believe in democracy. Similarly, Republicans don't monopolize republics, right? So every political party takes on a label. And I ha have been ha have spent months saying that religious Zionism has to save itself from the religious Zionist party. And Zionism, which is a very broad movement, which has many different facets, both historically and today, has to save itself from the ugliest expressions of Jewish nationalism, which are trying to hijack a very neutral and very inspiring story and turn it into something that is not the kind of nationalism I want. And it's very interesting because we're talking today uh, during the uh, New Hampshire primary, when in the United States of America too, as you point out, there's a big debate. Now, I also, when I look at what's going on in the United States of America, wearing my American presidential hist historian's hat, I say, wait a minute, I'm not going to let Donald Trump define nationalism. He defines nationalism in a certain way. But I, as an American historian, cannot explain all the successes that America has had since 1776, and even, I'll be controversial, since 1619, all the ways in which we've progressed without talking about nationalism. But the nationalism I'm talking about is not a Trumpian nationalism, but again, a liberal democratic nationalism. So I always emphasize that my nationalism, both when I talk about America and when I talk about Israel, has a first name and a middle name, liberal democratic nationalism, liberal, liberal democratic Americanism, liberal democratic Zionism. Do you worry that the nationalism of Itamar Ben-Gvir and others, Smoltrich, is on the rise? And if so, do you have a theory as to why that might be? It's very difficult to know what's happening after October 7th politically, partially because there's been kind of this silence, right? There's been an, uh, uh, there's been an understanding that during wartime, you shouldn't have big debates. So as someone who over three and a half years ago called for Bibi Netanyahu's resignation, uh, I, I've been very careful not to Bibi bash. I wrote one column in which I said that Bibi should resign, not immediately because it's too complicated during wartime, but say I'm going to resign on X date and then everything he said wouldn't be seen through a political lens. Now, when I wrote, I wrote that about three or four weeks into the war and a number of my friends said, Gil, you said you weren't going to be political. This is very political. How dare you? And what's interesting is many of them have come back to me and said, you know what? I see what you were saying. I was actually trying to say that sometimes you have to kind of transcend politics in order to avoid partisanship, in order to avoid being seen as 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 partisan, so that's a way into the conversation. I I I don't think that some of the bullying and some of the bigotry and some of the buffoonery that we've seen from uh, Ben Gvir in particular is necessarily inherent in Zionism. I see there are all kinds of issues going on. There's a question about what Zionism is. There's a huge question these days about how democracies function. Uh, I see that Ben Gvir is as much a product of the what we call the Twitter world, but now the X world, 
uh, social media bringing out a polarization and to just simply hang it on Zionism, to simply hang it on modern Israel today, as I know uh, some of your previous guests may have done, is just not, I think, intellectually honest. I think that there are different dimensions going on. There's been a long debate in Zionism about where it's going, what, what it's, go what's, what, what it's going to be. I think clearly Ben Gvir very cleverly took advantage of the moment, ran with certain currents, but I'm really hoping that in the wake of October 7th, what do we hear from the reservists? What do we hear from the regular soldiers? What do we hear from the young people? Stop with the demonization. Stop with the polarization. Stop with the thuggery. And Ben Gvir particularly built his whole career on that. And it'll be really interesting to see. It'll be tragic. I'm not predicting. I'm just a historian, right? So I looked at the past. It'll be tragic if as soon as the war is over, whenever that's determined, we go back to that and he's able to continue to build his career on that. It'll be amazing. It'll be transformational, not just for Israel, but for the entire Western world. If there's a movement that I'm trying to call for within Israel to have a different tone in politics, where if you disrespect anybody else, you're out. You're not going to get a million likes. But part of the problem is a media that feeds off of it, a social media that feeds off of it, and a culture that has been somewhat brutalized here in America and uh, elsewhere. Why, why are so many modern people critical of Israel, both on college campuses and in the media and in the world? It's a great question. I think there are two parts to it. I hate to give the first part of the answer. And 20 years ago, I wouldn't have. But we certainly saw this on October 7th. On October 7th, we saw a viciousness, a sadism in the attack on Israel that was truly anti-Semitic. So in Israel, we saw an anti-Semitic form of anti-Zionism. And on college campuses, in my own home, and I say, look at me, I'm a case of arrested development. I got to cut university, never wanted to leave and became a professor. We saw an anti-Semitism that was also, that had, that used a hatred of Israel to jump on board. Now, if on October 7th, when we were first hearing in America, these reports of just despicable, disgusting violence at Harvard, 30 student groups, before they condemned Israel, had stopped and sat with some of their Jewish friends, some of their Israeli friends, maybe even some of their women friends, and said, wow, I can't imagine mass rape, mass pillaging, mass kidnapping, mass murder. What a horrible thing. And then the next minute, or waited until Israel's bombing started, then issued their proclamations saying, you know, Israel shouldn't be bombing or should use different tactics. Then I'd say, okay, this wasn't irrational. This wasn't anti-Semitic. But the speed with which so many people jump from, oh, Israel's attacked, it's Israel's fault. Israel's attacked, I'm exhilarated. And when that history professor at Cornell University was called out, he didn't, he, he said, oh, I, I was a bad choice of words. He didn't apologize for his tone. So I hate to say that the first half of the sentence, but the first half of the answer is that, unfortunately, there is an obsession with Israel. There's an obsession with the Jews. There is a viciousness. There is an evil out there which is called anti-Semitism. I prefer to call it Jew hatred because it's an uglier term and it doesn't sound so clinical. And the first half of the answer is that for centuries, the Jew was singled out as the source of all evil. Today, the collective Jew, the Jewish state, Israel, how could it be this one country, this one small country is responsible for so many crimes and all the big crimes, any Western crime, imperialism, colonialism, um, white supremacy, ethnic ethnic cleansing, really? And is it that simple? So that's one half of it. The second half of it is that we've seen over the last 10, 15 years, but it, this goes back for 30 and 40 years, that there's a, a, a an ideology which has emerged. Some people call it postmodernism. Some people call it woke. Some people call it critical race studies. Some people call it anti-colonialism or decolonialism, which has created a whole world of good and evil. And Israel... First of all, Israelis have been cast as white and Jews have been cast as white, even though there are many Jews who are not white, and even there, though there are many Palestinians who are white. But somehow or other, Palestinians became holy and brown people who are always oppressed and always blameless. And Israelis became essentially evil. Anyone who goes to the complexity of the Middle East and goes to such oversimplifications is, I think, doing the complexity of the Middle East and, and truth a disservice. And I'm very careful to call out the evil of Hamas, but I don't say that every Palestinian is evil. 
I say those who raped, pillaged, plundered, joined in, applauded, were part of an evil. But why demonize a whole people? Why deny the fact that Palestinians have a national identity? It doesn't help me at all. And by the way, I'll go to an Orthodox synagogue and I'll say that and I'll say, you know, this is a national conflict between Palestinians and Israelis. And that means that I acknowledge there's this thing called Palestinian nationalism, right? It's not a racial conflict, but it's a national conflict. And some of them are, oh, what are you talking about? There's no such thing. I said, no, why, why, why rob them of their identity? I know how painful it is when somebody looks at me and go, oh, you know, Judaism, it's just a religion. It's not a nation. And I go, what, have you read the Bible? Have you read my story? How dare you define me? So I will never, ever redefine them. And I respect the fact that Palestinians have a story and have an identity. I won't get into who came first because that's not helpful. But I also can call out Palestinian political culture, which I argue has been particularly addicted to a politics of demonization, a politics of terrorism, a politics of rejectionism. That's an attack on a political culture, not an attack on a people. Mm -hmm. So more what, than you asked for. But, uh, <laughs> no, it's great. No, I love it. Um, what what culpability do you think Israel has in the conflict? So you you obviously you've pointed to and you've gestured at all sorts of things that you think Palestinian leadership is responsible for, including uh, terrorism and and not you know uh, you call Ar Arafat's war on the Oslo peace accords and things like that. What 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 um, if someone wants to criticize Israel from your perspective? What what are some valid criticisms, if any? So first of all, th there are different kinds of criticisms, right? I, you know, as I said, I write this column in the Jerusalem Post, and if I never criticized Israel, if I never criticized the prime minister, if I never criticized the government, it would be the most boring column in the world. Now, it may still be the most boring column in the world, but th there's criticism and there's demonization, right? I'll get to the second half of your question in a second, but first, let, let's, let's clarify our terms. My problem with the way Israel is discussed is that people do what I call the delegitimization derby. It doesn't happen with your parents, Right, you love your parents, but you get critical of them. But you rarely go from "I disagree with what they did" to "therefore they're evil." It doesn't happen often with your own country, but somehow or other with Israel, it goes from "I dislike this prime minister" or Ben Gvir or the occupation or this to "therefore Israel's evil." So we have to be careful with the terms of criticism and demonization. Um, are there so are there valid criticisms of Israel of this government of all kinds of things? As I said, there's even a valid debate about what tactics Israel should should undergo and should be using right now. So that's all within the realm of a healthy back and forth. My definition of patriotism is a patriot is someone who loves his or her country because of the politicians sometimes, but despite the politics always. And that's an attempt to kind of say, we need robust debate. What kind of democracy can go forward without robust debate? Having said that, that wasn't really your question. Your question was, I've... Been, I've pointed out the Palestinians' culpability. I've been very clear that October 7th and uh, it is all on Hamas, and I'll go even further with that before I get to the essence of your question and say that Israel withdrew from every last inch of, uh, of Gaza in 2005, and the fact that it turned into Hamasistan and turned into this massive armada rather than the Riviera of the Middle East is on them, not on us. So when it comes to Gaza, I actually feel that Israel is on the whole not perfect, but extraordinarily good. <laughs> Where has Israel made mistakes? Look, what I said about my, my visits to Orthodox synagogues. For many, many years, mainstream Zionist thought didn't acknowledge that there were Palestinian people. For many, many years, look, until 1966, Israeli Arabs didn't have um, full rights. They were under military rule. And it was, by the way, it was one of the people who pushed for it was somebody from the right, Menachem Begin. And there's been an extraordinary story of how Israeli Arabs have become increasingly more a part of the story, such that 20% of doctors today are, uh, are Arabs in Israel and 40% of pharmacists. And I've seen different numbers of 20, 30, 40% of nurses. So has Israel been perfect all the time vis-a-vis -vis its own Arabs, let alone its neighbors? Of course not. Natan Sharansky, with whom I uh, wrote a book, Never Alone, he says, you know what the greatest crime Israel perpetuated on the Palestinians was? Oslo. Because he says that Yitzhak Rabin and Shimon Peres, in their rush to get a deal back in the 1990s, brought Arafat back from Tunisia and imposed the PLO, the Palestine Liberation Organization, terrorist organization, dictatorship, on the Palestinians. And he said all kinds of other mistakes that may have been made by Israel in the course of, 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 of military battles are mistakes that are kind of understandable. He says this was intentional. It was part of a strategy which the United States, the PLO, the world, and the Israeli leadership bought into 
And he said it ended up with them being under this horrific dictatorship, which has only gotten worse and worse, especially with Hamas. So is it a complicated story? Absolutely. Have there been blind spots that Israel's, Israelis had over the years? Absolutely. Do I think that the demonization that I hear from certain pockets, as I said earlier, of the religious Zionist community um, uh, is despicable? Absolutely. Do I make a distinction between settlements that are really Jewish villages that have been resettled or rebuilt uh, after Jordan overran them in 1948-49, uh, like the area of Gush Etzion, and what they call hilltop settlements, which are in your face and attempts to kind of annoy and 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 get under the Palestinian skin? Absolutely. So there are all kinds of things I can criticize, but do I demonize? No. Mm -hmm. Um, with a lot of questions. Do you remember... I don't remember. It's before my time, but the the campaign against apartheid in South Africa um, was there demonization of South Africa at the time when people in the world community yeah. were fighting against uh, apartheid in South Africa. So it's a very interesting question because one of the things that was complicated about what was happening in South Africa was there was a demonization of the apartheid government, right? But you couldn't demonize the South African people because the mass number of South African people is part of the whole apartheid struggle. Was say. Let the majority rule. But no, you know what? For all the, it's a, it's a, it's actually a very interesting question. For all the anger that there was, if we did a kind of, both a content analysis and a an emotional tenor analysis of the way the apartheid fight played out. And look, I was on campus in the 80s and 90s, early 90s, it, you know, apartheid regime ended in the early 90s. Uh, when, when, you know, there were in certain campuses, uh, professors and certainly university presidents felt they couldn't go to a student cocktail, because we had cocktail by, by, back then, or, or student interaction uh, without being attacked about South Africa. The viciousness, the obsessiveness, the delight in, um, the sadistic delight in the raping and pillaging that we saw on October 7th, I would really challenge a historian to show me that that was there in the anti-apartheid movement. It wasn't there. Was there fury at the African leadership that had an absolutely heinous um, uh, regime and 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 racist approach, absolutely. But it didn't it didn't reach the same levels of obsession. Mm -hmm. um, and that's the anti-Semitism piece. That's the true. That's that's the part where you smell a kind of traditional Jew hatred. Mm -hmm. Is Israel's often characterized as an ethno state? Is that an accurate characterization? I you know I have a problem. I read the Declaration of Independence. I read texts. And when you read the Declaration of Independence of Israel and you compare it to so many European countries, let alone Muslim countries, which are not called ethnostates, um, I see a country that is trying to balance democracy and particularism, universalism and particularism. When I see that in the Declaration of Independence, written in May 1948, with seven Arab armies attacking, and they acknowledge other inhabitants, and they offer equality to all those inhabitants. And again, as I already pointed out, until 1966, that, that was merely a promise that, was, that wasn't even close to being fulfilled. I see that Israel's just more, more complicated. And that's, again, what's so fascinating to me and so depressing is that there are all kinds of words you could use to describe Israel, but the need to call it colonialist, when it wasn't like the British going to North America or to India, um, it's we have roots here. We, the original Aboriginal people. Why use the word colonialism? Because you're trying to demonize. Why use the word ethno state? Because you're trying to demonize. The whole decolonial language, the whole package of imperialism, colonialism, racism is an attempt to not criticize but demonize and to also fit Israel into a, a Western box. Israel, Jews confuse. We're a people in a religion. We had ties to Europe, some of us, including my great great grandparents who were in Europe but there are other of my neighbors who had ties to um, uh, Muslim lands. And there are others of my neighbors who, who whose families have been here for 10, 11, 12 generations. Why the need to put us in one little box? That's when you go, ah, the jump from the complexity of history, the nuance to the labeling is a form of demonization. And that's what happens with Zionism again and again and again. For example, Let's go on the other side. Everybody talks about the Palestinians living under their, you know, fig and olive tree um, for generations. What about the fact that the British census, the British census, 
from the night from 1920 to 1930 shows that the nomadic Arabs all of a sudden saw when the British came in with the British mandate, huh, there's prosperity, there's jobs. And there was movement of nomadic Arabs from what we would now call present day Jordan and Libya and Syria to this more organized, more flourishing place, which was called Palestine at the time, based on what the Romans had called it. And so not every single Palestinian has been here for 2000 years. Jews confuse and Palestinians confuse, but Palestinians are given one simple identity. Jews are given a simple, another simple identity. And that, what does that lead to? It leads to demonization. And it leads to this kind of impossibility to compromise. Once you acknowledge messiness, once you acknowledge that there are some Palestinians who've been here for a long time, some Palestinians who came more recently, once you acknowledge that Jews have deep ties here, but there are also some who came more recently, then you can start saying, okay, how do we go ahead? What Anybody who talks to me about the map, right? And this happens with right-wing uh, Israeli settlers. It happens with Palestinians. The map. What's the map? In the biblical times, the map shifted at least six times. In the 20th century, the map shifted at least six times. In the 21st century, the map shift, shifted two or three times. So don't talk to me about the borders, the boundaries, the map. You do that, and I can already hear you're a fool or a fanatic. Acknowledge the flow of history. And then also look at context. What happened in India, Pakistan? What happened here? What happened there? Why this need to kind of impose a, 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 a simplistic paradigm on this one very messy and very, very small place? The 2018 nation state law, does, mm -hmm. that, does that sort of feel like a kind of um, enshrining into law uh, of an ethno state to you or no? So again, the 2018 uh, basic law didn't negate the Declaration of Independence, which I already referenced. It didn't negate many of the Supreme Court decisions. And one of the fascinating things right now, we're living in, 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 in historical times. We're living in massive changes. One of the things that we're seeing, and by the way, it's very relevant to today because um, at least one of the um, the people who was, uh, who, at least one of the soldiers who died, I'm checking his name, Ahmad Abu Latif, was a Bedouin soldier. And Israeli Jews are very, very conscious of the fact that, as I said earlier, 70% of Israeli Arabs are supporting them, that there's one Druze village which last count, and I'm sure it's been updated tragically, has buried over 67 um, soldiers since the start of the, uh, of the state, but that number has been updated in the war. And one of the things that people are talking about is that after this war, maybe one of the things we need to do is update the nation state bill to a version which I wanted back in 2016, 2017, and 2018. And that version was, even though it was implicit, I said, I, I wrote a column saying, obviously, we know this. We know that by Israeli law, by the Supreme Court, this nation state, lay, na nation state law won't negate the equality promise of the Declaration of Independence. But you know what? Make an important symbolic statement. So did all of a sudden through that one line, I know Shalom Magid loves to jump on that law and say that's why Israel's an ethno state. I, I, I look at it and it's more complicated. Did it did the DNA of the state change overnight? Did all the signs um, in Arabic in my neighborhood in Jerusalem disappear overnight? No. Was it an unnecessary insult to my Druze brothers and sisters, to my Bedouin brothers and sisters, to my Arab brothers and sisters? Yes. Was it something I fought tooth and nail? Absolutely. In a democracy, do I sometimes win and sometimes lose? Yes. And do I dust myself off and put up my dukes and get ready to fight for another day? Absolutely. Do you feel the current war, as it's been going on for months, is making Israel safer? Uh, no one wants to hear this, but absolutely. I have a cousin, Adele Raymer, who was on Kibbutz Nirim. And by the way, Israelis don't want to hear this either because everybody's in, so stuck in their trauma zone. But I have a cousin, Adele Raymer, who was in a um, in, in her uh, safe room for 11 hours on Kibbutz Nirim, um, a lefty who spent all her time and energy hoping to build bridges with the Gazans, like so many of the people in the Kibbutz Nirim that day who were killed. And when I think of when she will be able to return, to her home. And she said, I just want to sleep in my bed at night. There are two dimensions to it. Objectively, she is so much safer today than she was October 6th. Subjectively, psychologically, she feels so much more threat. Why? Because since October 7th, 8th, 9th, since the war began, Israel has pushed back the Gazans, and I say the Gazans, 
because so many of them were hostile. So many who came in the second and third wave weren't just Hamasnikim, but were what they call Shababim, who were just the regular people coming in to rape and pillage and plunder and often murder and kidnap. And um, so there's a, there's going to be more of a, a demilitarized zone. The mind-boggling, mind-boggling tunnel structure um, and weaponry that Hamas has amassed has been degraded. And so objectively speaking, Israel is much safer today than it was October 6th. Subjectively, obviously they're not going back to their homes because we're still in a wartime. The challenge for people on both sides of the border is to see after this war, can we get to an equilibrium where on the one hand, we don't have a Hamas regime which is raising too many Palestinians in Gaza just to hate, which is spending too many of its resources, 98%, and then they build themselves some villas building tunnels and building armaments and, and trying to destroy us, and instead decides to have a... where we, we end up with a different Palestinian leadership which wants to live there. And on the Israeli side of the border, can we create a new regime and a new, and a new equilibrium so that the kibbutzim can return to full functioning and can feel safe again? And I, I think it's unfair to underestimate the degree, to, and I'm not saying you're doing that, I'm speaking you know, to the world. It's unfair to underestimate the degree to which Israelis were really traumatized by what happened. 1,200 killed, 900 civilians, 360 celebrating at a, at a music festival. Babies, 12-year-old girls, 5-year-old girls, unspeakable things done to them. How do we get that sense of safety back? That's a real challenge. And what do you do? How do you fight an enemy which hides behind uh, hides behind his hospitals, so I call them hospitals, that hides behind mosques, so I call them Hamasks? They're not real mosques, they're not real hospitals, and they manipulate the world. How do you do this? How do you fight a war with two hands tied behind your back? Do you think that uh, areas where there are tremendous amounts of trauma and despair and, and that's been raised art with a Z, to the ground, you know, by bombs. Do you think those are are areas that that are sort of bre become breeding grounds for for hatred? You might say hatred against Israel, uh, terrorism. So, here's the irony of that question. In 2005, Israel withdrew from every inch of Gaza. In 2005, Ariel Sharon's military uh, strategists and generals rebelled almost. They said, "Don't leave." The Philadelphia corridor, which is now emerging as a major issue, that um, eight mile, eight to nine mile strip of land between uh, the southernmost part of Gaza and um, and and uh, and Egypt, don't do it. And he said, "No, I don't want people accusing us of occupying one inch of Gaza. It's complicated enough. The West Bank. Let's just at least have Gaza clear." Had the Palestinians had leadership that wanted to live a quality of life. Billions of dollars would have flown in from the Norwegians and the Canadians and the Israelis. And today, as I said, it would be the Riviera. So, and, and what happened was that even with that carte blanche, even with that opportunity, what happened? Hamas by 2007 took over, but the, but the hatred and the, and the violence was already building as of 2005. They raised their kids to hate. So you're asking me, a people who have already been raised to hate, a people who already saw any resources that were given to them hijacked and turned into armaments, is there going to be more hatred? Yeah, but is that on me? Look at the political culture they developed. Look at what they had when they had more autonomy. And look at the opportunities they had that they gave up. So my problem is, how do we get out of this impasse? And I'm not, I'm not willing to just stop and freeze everything on October 7th. I need us to go forward. And I'm not willing to stop and freeze everything at this moment when did you point out there's tremendous suffering. And, you know, again, anyone who doesn't think that someone on this side of the border, I shouldn't say anyone because there are some people, but but many of us on this side of the border don't feel badly about children and women and uh, innocent men starving. I'm not afraid of that word. Uh, killed. Um, displaced. It, it's awful. And I'll put it in the most selfish terms. It's not only because I'm an altruist. It's not only because I care about human beings, but also I worry about our kids' souls, right? I worry about what does it mean to be a part of an army that does these things? On the other hand, there's a phrase that I'm sure you learned when you were younger, Ain brera. I feel like there really is no alternative. Why didn't, you know, everybody else cease fire? I'm all for a ceasefire. 
Let's have a ceasefire from Hezbollah, which has been shooting rockets at Israel for no good reason. Let's have a ceasefire from the Houthis. Let's have a ceasefire from Hamas, which includes freeing 136 hostages, who knows how many are still alive, including some women who every report is are enduring unspeakable rape. Then we'll talk about ceasefire. Why is it always on Israel? Let's have some, let's have some back and forth. Let's let, you know, what would happen if tomorrow Sinwar said, you know what, or the Gazans said, you know, we've had enough. This is, and this has happened before with dictatorships. Look at what you did to us. Look at what your decisions have wrought. Look at what your leadership has done. Look at how much money you stole from us and used to build your tunnels. Get out of here. And they started picking up the phone and calling Israel and say, you know what, there are two hostages here. There are three hostages here. And the people of Gaza rebelled, not against Israel, but against their captors. Well, then it'd be a very different story. But because that hasn't happened, there's one of two possibilities. Either they're so crushed by a Hamas regime, which has actually already been degraded, or they're in collaboration with the regime. History will tell us. I've read from a few different places. I read that uh, there was a deal on the table that if Hamas stays in power and a ceasefire, Israel can get the hostages back. I read that the generals have claimed that there's an, the inco it's an incompatible aim to destroy Hamas and get the hostages back. And just intuitively, it makes sense. I think Hamas holding hostages, hold, they hold the cards. Either the hostages die and Hamas is deposed or Hamas stays in power and the hostages are returned. So if that's if that's sort of the choice, which is sort of like an impossible choice, do you, do you have opinion, an opinion about, about which side Israel should, should choose? So uh, let's divide this into three questions. First, um, when... In October 7th, when Israel took the decision to go to war against Hamas, and Hamas was holding 240 hostages, I don't think any intelligent human being really believes that had Israel not unleashed tremendous firepower, that Hamas um, would have given up the first 100 hostages. And I think it's quite clear that the tremendous firepower that Israel unleashed and the tremendous pressure that Hamas was under was part of the story that led to the release of 100 hostages. Frankly, and this is why I never predict, I, I was I feared, I mourned that all 240 would never see the light of day again. And so it was actually a remarkable mix of military might and diplomacy that freed the 100 hostages. What I just said is also true about diplomacy, right? If anybody says that without any diplomacy, those 100 hostages would have been freed, they're equally as foolish as someone who thinks, right? So, so the we don't know exactly the inside story, but we can certainly as outsiders say, something extraordinary happened that freed 100 lives and, and saved 100 lives. And that was a combination. And by the way, it included the, the, the Thai, the Thai uh, workers who were also in my heart. Um, so it was a weird combination of military might and diplomacy. That's part one. Part two, what will, what, why did the deal, deal blow up? Nobody knows. My personal theory at the time watching it and watching that Hamas stopped it was I feared that they had run out of female hostages who could look presentable, given what reports for the hostages who were released say has been happening to those women and some of the men who are being held in sexual slavery. Can you imagine we're talking in the 21st century about sexual slavery? So there's that second piece of why did it, why did the deal blow up the second at, at the second time? And now there's this debate in Israel. I really the truth is, I don't know the answer. I think it's an impossible situation that Israel has been put in. I think it's been a possible situation that the hostages have been put in. I heard one hostage father interviewed today on radio, and he said two really fascinating things. He said, one, he said, you know, my son suffers from colitis. And he's, I'm sorry, from Crohn's disease. And, you know, you can imagine what the stress is doing to him. You can imagine what the conditions are doing to him. You can imagine the irritation to, to, to his colon. It just breaks my heart. Why is my government, he said, why is my government allowing humanitarian aid, allowing fuel to go to the people on the other side of the border when my son isn't getting it. And we don't know. They said that there was a deal for the medicine to come in. We don't know if the Qataris delivered the medicine or not. We don't know if it went to Sinwar's best friend or son or lover or himself. We don't know. It's just a question mark. Anybody who tells me he knows or she knows is, is lying because there's no proof. So, he, so then the interviewer said, ah, assuming that he must be on the side of like, you know, blow the hell out of him. So he said, I understand that there are two factions in the hostages, within the hostage community, those who are pushing for some kind of deal, as you suggested, or those who are saying fight to the end. Which faction are you from? And he said something extraordinary. He said, I'm just from my family faction. I'm not a part of any faction. 
since October 7th, I wake up every day and every one of my families and every one of my members of my community wake up and we work 24 seven just to free my son. And it brought home the, the human dimension to this. And there's so many tragic stories on both sides. And I don't just say that to throw words out. And, and the truth is anybody who's sure what would happen, anybody who's really, really confident, as you can tell from the theme here, they're the ones who scare me because it's a leap into the unknown. I really don't know how much more military pressure. My instinct tells me at this point that more military pressure is helping, but I, I don't know uh, what would what will free the hostages. I don't know how many of them are still alive. I don't believe 136 are. The number has been thrown out that at least 27 are dead. We don't know their condition. It, it's 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 really a series of impossible decisions. And I'll be I'll 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 I'll, I'll throw something out. The fact that we have a prime minister who has lost so much credibility with his own people, including this guy, me. The fact that we have a prime minister who has so little credibility with the United States of America. The fact that we have a prime minister who has so overstayed his welcome and who is a walking advertisement for term limits. Uh, the fact that we have a prime minister who is so hurt politically, especially by the disaster of October 7th, and that he's the one who has to take this decision means that inevitably it will be politicized. Inevitably it will be questioned. And had we a prime minister who was a Winston Churchill, a Margaret Thatcher, a Franklin Roosevelt, a Golda Meir, who spoke to the people from the very start, acknowledged the complexity, and led us on a journey to come together to some kind of understanding of all the difficult dilemmas and the unhappy choices that you have in war, we'd be in a very different situation. But I'm a historian. I'm not allowed to say if and had. I'm just supposed to say this is what happened. So we're in a situation now where we have a prime minister with all those deficits, with all those weaknesses, with all those failures, and we have him leading us down a path of impossible, heartbreaking, mind-blowing, difficult decisions. And that's part of the tragedy of this moment. Mm -hmm. uh, what would you like to see as an eventual resolution to the conflict down the road? So let me let me just add one more thought to that. I, I I don't want people to therefore conclude that with all my criticism of Netanyahu, I buy into the camp that oh he's having such a good time running the war and he's gonna he wants to continue it to keep himself in power. I actually think that's such a misreading of what's happening with, in Israel. The sooner Bibi Netanyahu gets a victory, the sooner Israel gets a victory, and the sooner Bibi Netanyahu gets some kind of and I'm I'm putting this in quotation marks because I I know my history of Iraq War you know mission accomplished picture. As soon as he gets some kind of picture of three heads of Hamas and 40 free hostages, the better off he is. So I just want to give my political yeah. assessment on that. I'll just say the other analogy of the Iraq war is that America went to war to defeat Al-Qaeda and they were successful. Right. They defeated Al-Qaeda and they got ISIS. I mean, right. and by the way, if you don't deal with right. the fundamental cause of why Al-Qaeda is there. That, right. and, and by the way, from, the, from October 7th, I've also been saying, don't tell me. Don't, first of all, don't, you know, remember Theodore Herzl, uh, Theodore Herzl, Theodore Roosevelt, speak softly and carry a big stick. Don't tell me you're going to knock them off in Qatar, as somebody, as one of the people in the, in the in leadership said publicly. I'm not giving away any secrets. Don't tell me that we're going to destroy Hamas and eliminate Hamas's movement. If Hamas is an idea, if Hamas is a movement, what, what kind of war aim is that? Don't tell me that your war aim is to just get one guy's head, because look how long it took the United States of America to track down Osama bin Laden, who was in an allied, who was living in, you know, in, in, in an allied country uh, called Pakistan. So from the start, as an American historian, right, sharing some of the background that you have as well, I was wary of overheated rhetoric, of war aims that are out of control, and that are unrealistic. So what am I, what, what, what looks like a day after? It has to be in what we call shlavim in, 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 um, in, uh, in stages. The first, and I know this is not popular, is there has to be a demilitarized zone. There has to be a one kilometer zone, which is on the Palestinian side, the Gazan side, where they lose territory, because that is a language that's the traditional language of war. You attack me, whether it's your dictatorship regime or a democracy, you attack me, you lose. There's disputed territory, you lose, you lose territory too. And there has to be a demilitarized zone. And by the way, demilitarized zone would be good for them too, because I think they need distance from us in order to try to create some kind of new equilibrium. So the first thing is to stop the war, degrade Hamas as much as is possible, preserve as much civilian life as is possible, and as quickly as possible try to get to the rebuilding, or at least the equilibrium phrase, with this new DMZ. 
with a new reality. Phase two, I think there's something that's underlying Palestinian culture, which is missed when we throw on words like the Palestinians or the Gazans even, is that they're, and I, and I say this out of respect, I don't say this out of, out, of, out, of, out of judgment, but Westerners have become much more nationalized and many more Palestinians operate by tribal and clan associations. And there is a theory that says, maybe what we have to do is go back to some of the clans in Gaza. And there are some clans, that, clans in Gaza, which clashed with Hamas in 2005, six, seven, and eight, and got defeated. Maybe the clans or other forms of local leadership can emerge and you have to have some kind of de hamasization So again, I don't use the words of eliminating Hamas because that's an ideology, but of, 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 of shrinking their influence, shrinking their power, empowering others. Obviously the Israeli fantasy is to include the Egyptians and include the Saudi Arabians, include the UAE. I'm realistic enough to know that the Egyptians don't want to touch it. The Saudi Arabians don't want to touch it. The UAE doesn't want to touch it. But if that's why I say, if you start with the clans and you start with some local leadership, then you have a chance at creating some kind of equilibrium, creating some kind of momentum, and then you can bring in other players. And long term, long term, so ten years, twenty years, fifty years, a hundred years. What's what's it going to look like in a in a what, what's the resolution eventually? I have no problem. Right now, if you drive to um, to Beit El, which is in Judea Samaria, the territories, West Bank, whatever you want to call it, when you drive along that road, or you go to a wedding, the Pesagot Winery, you see Ramallah which is the Palestinian capital. And atop the flag, atop the, and, and, and it's a series of hills that they have, and you see Palestinian flags waving. Let me tell you, as a nationalist, as a liberal democratic nationalist, when I see their flags waving over an area which I'm, as an Israeli, not allowed to enter, I say, fine. I actually say, this is very October, you know, pre-October 6th thinking, I say, if they can express themselves nationally, if they can start focusing on what they have and not what we have, then we have a shot at peace. So would I potentially see in the future with this demilitarized zone and more boots on the ground on our side, an independent state of Gaza or Gaza aligned with the West Bank? And by the way, it's the Gazans and the Palestinians of the West Bank who fought tooth and nail, who didn't cooperate. I have absolutely no problem. And by the way, this is where I call out my friends on the right. I say, you know, you haven't entered into all kinds of cities um, and, and, and villages in um, in Area A, which the Palestinians controlled for years. What do you care if they express their national identity there? So call that a two-state solution, a three-state solution. I would love for them to focus on what they have, not what we have. I would lo love to see them create a different kind of culture. And you go, oh, it's impossible. And you know what? This is where being an American historian helps. Because I know how impossible it seemed when we talked about Germany, not we, but our, you know, my, my, my great grandparents and grandparents uh, in 1945, when we talked about Japan in 1945. And if Japan and Germany could change, I really believe it's possible for anybody to change. But they have to accept Israel's rea reality and Israel's existence. And that's the key piece in the ideology which has to change. So you're imagining a two state solution? Is that what you're describing? Or is no, it or a multiple state it? solution? I, I have no problem with, with some kind of. I think, but right now, when anybody talks about a two-state solution and doesn't acknowledge both the failure of Oslo, which led to a thousand terrorist deaths, and the failure of the Gaza disengagement, they're dreaming in technicolor. So right now, spare me two-state solution rhetoric unless you've solved that problem of Palestinian exterminationism and Palestinian addiction to terrorism. And now I am using the word Palestinian, not Hamas, not Gaza. Is it possible that what you're calling exterminationism emerges from a sense of uh, trying to get a second state? Uh, no, because actually, if you look at their track record, when they've had chances of getting something and they've blown them up, they've gone backwards rather than forwards. As with 2005, the disengagement, as with Ehud Olmert's series of uh, concessions, which he offered in 2007, 2008, which even the great left-wing Israeli thinker, Aleph Bet Yehoshua, said, if they can't accept that, Mm -hmm. They'll never accept us. He recently died, but I, I had the privilege of meeting with him a year or two before he died. And he said, that was a moment where I said, oh my goodness, Palestinian leadership is still too committed. Leadership. Now now mm -hmm. I distinguish between Palestinian leadership and the Palestinian mm -hmm. people. Palestinian leadership is still too com too committed to exterminating us and not building themselves up. So you imagine a future where the Palestinians put down their animosity and their weapons, and then Israel grants basically a second state. With the international community working, 
And mm -hmm. we have a territorial compromise, right? We have, and, and it'll, by the way, it'll, it'll, it'll include some withdrawals that'll pain, that are painful for Israel. Just like Israel withdrew from 21 settlements in Gaza and four settlements in Samaria, in the West Bank uh, in 2005, it might include some messiness on our side, but it can only come once there's a recognition on the international, let's just put the Palestinians aside, the international community, the Biden administration, the UN continues to parrot this phrase, two-state solution, without acknowledging how painful the two-state solution talk has been, because it led to the disengagement, it led to Oslo, and it led to thousands of deaths. First, put that into your historical equation. First, explain how we're not going to make the same mistake again. Then go forward. Right. And that's not on us. That's on them. And when I say them, I say not only Palestinians. I say all the other people who are just parroting this phrase, this slogan, which frankly in Israel, it's kind of like three months after 9-11 coming to the United States of America and say, oh, make peace with, uh, with, with Al-Qaeda, make peace with bin Laden. And that was before bin Laden was a TikTok uh, hero. Mm -hmm. Well, I guess, I guess the other perspective is that Evidence has shown with decades of, of settlement building and, and decades of, of sort of uh, evictions and, 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 and building roads and, and building settlements between, you know, Palestinian towns that, that Israel has no appetite at this point, like you're saying. So this is to sort of confirm what you're saying, really zero appetite for a two state solution and has taken zero steps in, you know, even leaving out a possibility of a two state solution over a decade no, I, long. No, I, I, I would say that certainly I, I was talking about Octo since October, since October 7th. The many of the two-state solution people were killed or are in the army um, or fighting for their lives or are fighting for their limbs. Um, so yes, right now, right now, to talk about a two-state solution is 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 immature. It's mm. like it's it's so it's 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 like asking the United States to to surrender to Japan three months after Pearl Harbor. Like, what are you talking about? If you want to talk about a two-state solution, first acknowledge the pain, acknowledge the miscalculation acknowledge the international community's failures, acknowledge Palestinian rejectionism, and start, not me, it's not on me, on you. You know, I'm, I'm saying it broadly. Mm -hmm. Build a path. Learn from history, right? Don't repeat the mistakes and repeat the rhetoric without saying, look, sit what it's like to, think about what it's like to sit uh, in, in, the, in, in the hotels that are now um, filled with kibbutznikim from Be'eri, or frankly, the people from the North who were just in the north and all of a sudden Hezbollah decided, oh, let's attack them because it's Tuesday. Mm. What do you tell them? How do you how do you explain to them why they should make this leap of faith? You don't get to a leap of faith until there's been some good faith built up. And mm. the serve that they got, they gave us on October 7th, north and south, was a very, very lethal one. So the 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 next serve of peace, of hope, of faith shouldn't come from us, should come from them. Okay. Um, I'm, I'm tempted to uh, invite a, a Palestinian voice on my channel as well. Do you think that would be a bad idea? They would probably talk about the experience of living under occupation, the experience of, you know, settler violence, the experience of, you know, uh, settlements being built up on land that you had, you know, used to farm and things like that. The experience of, you know, family trauma, you know, not. And I would say that every one of those things you said, with, it's, I'm sorry to cut you off, but every, every, each of the four things you said are not things that any Gazan can say with sincerity since August 2005. Well, how about fishing in their own waters? How about being ah, able to import but, but, import goods from the outside world? So, to, so let, let's country. have a thought experiment. If in 2005, they had accepted the $14 million of greenhouses that were given, and in 2005, they had started a peace path, do you think they would they would they, would they have beautiful hotels and would they be able to fish wherever the heck they wanted? You, you have to take some responsibility. You see, when we, and it gets back to one of your earlier questions. The whole decolonization rhetoric and racket takes any agency, any responsibility from the oppressed and says, oh, you don't have to call them out for anything. And I'm sorry, as a historian, I call them out. Spare me your, your tale of woe if you don't take any responsibility for any mistakes your side made, any mistakes your leadership made, any candy you distributed to celebrate the murder of a child or the rape. Well, of I wouldn't talk to someone like that. I would talk to someone who'd be involved so, in peace. I'd be talk to someone who's so someone, involved so some, in, But but yeah. but I'd say if if they want to talk about settler violence in Hawara, that's something to talk about. But if you want to talk about settler violence in Gaza, you're dreaming in technicolor. So I would just say be careful about. You know the truthiness of it to use that word in quotation marks just you know and 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 the real thing would be and it would be really interesting to have a, a an honest conversation with the palestinians and say can you distinguish 
the narrative of Gaza from the narrative of the West Bank? Mm -hmm. And is there something you can learn from the two narratives rather than clumping them all together? If you look, the propagandists always clump it together. So Human Rights Watch comes out with a report about Israel apartheid. I'm using that in quotation marks. And what do they do? They clump Israeli Arabs, Bedouin, Area A, Area B, Area C, Gaza, all in one, which is just from a political science and a political historian's perspective, just an assault on truth. And they make it one polity against the evil Jews. And, and that's in order to advance their narrative. And I try to go, and that's why I was even talking about tribes and, and, and localities. I try to go more nitty gritty and say, let's look, let's look. So it'd be really interesting to have a conversation with the Palestinians and say, hey, explain to me how you tell a story of Gaza in 2005, 2006, not just 2024. How do you explain Gaza and how do you, and are there any mistakes that were made on the Palestinian side in 2005, in 1948, in 1967, in, uh, during the uh, Oslo peace process? All that is pushed aside when it comes to colonialism, imperialism, because once we're evil, once Israel has committed so many sins, we're colonialists, we're imperialists, we're racist, we're white supremacists, we're an ethnostate, we're this, we're that. Who has to take any responsibility for the side? Because we've become Nazified. And that's not really, really helpful. And especially not helpful for academics, and especially not helpful for people who are diplomats, and especially not helpful for people who want to move forward. Let's live with the complexity and live with the messiness. We can end here. I think it's a fine place to end. If there's anything else you want to talk about, if there's anything else you want to ask or, or bring up or, or, or plug or, or just, you know, share with the audience, I'm happy to to, to give you the floor. No, Joe, I, I'll just you know end with one line, which is let, let's go back to, um, to, to the opening of the conversation, which is that as a Zionist, as someone who really believes in nationalism, I can't negate Palestinian nationalism. And I hope nothing I've said seems to do that. And it's really important for me that we figure out how to use nationalisms, all forms of nationalisms, to live together and to do what Theodor Herzl said, that, that hopefully by living together in our tribes, but also as friendly neighbors, we can elevate one another rather than knocking one uh, okay. another down. My nationalism is about soaring together, not knocking down the others. And if I can end with one, just one little story. Um, uh, last week I was in um, in, in the South and I was at the, the Nova uh, uh, concert place, this killing field, um, this wonderful, beautiful natural place, which was called, which was turned into a killing field. And they were a bunch of yeshiva kids in back, black and white, ultra Orthodox. And the rabbi got up and he said, I want you to go up and down and look at the pictures. They've created this informal memorial where they have sticks and on each stick are two sides, pictures of two of the people who were killed or kidnapped. He said, I want you to look at each one of those kids. And he says, look, we have a uniform, black and white. The soldiers have their uniform. These kids had their own uniform. It was party goers uniform. He said, and what was he saying? He was saying, don't look at them through the lens that you've been raised to of, oh, look, she has, she's showing her shoulders. Look at, he was saying, don't look at them that, look in their eyes and understand that each of them was a soul. Each of them is one of us. And each of them was murdered as a Jew. And I thought it was so extraordinary because what was he saying? And this is really the path forward. And it was a Jewish moment and a Zionist moment. If we can look past the uniforms and look at one another as human beings and look at the possibility of living together, then we're really fulfilling the Zionist dream where we're proud of our Jewishness and proud of our Zionism and proud of our history, but also willing to see the humanity in the other. Mm -hmm. And that's my hope. I can't predict it's going to happen, but I can promise that I'm going to do everything I can to make it happen. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Gil Troy. Thank you. Thanks for your questions.